Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a terrific topic and one of our great, great uh, uh, guests. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. For about a year now, we've been talking about AI, and we've often been talking about it in terms of the great corporate giants that are doing immense work in this field. Uh, OpenAI, for example, funded and owned more or less by Microsoft. We think about Meta, we think about Google, and we think about other companies as well, Amazon and Apple that are working in the space. And no shade here. They've done immense work, very, very influential work, very high profile work. And this is what we're reacting to in higher education. Uh, how to respond, for example, when Microsoft infuses AI into its office products. But at the same time, the open source world has been very, very busy. There have been a lot of open source projects which are really advancing the field in all kinds of ways. And after all of our forum sessions on AI, I wanted to make sure we'd have a chance to really dive into these. And there's no better guest I can think of on Earth than Ruben Puente Dura. You may know Ruben Puente Dura as the creator of the SAMR method of thinking through educational technology. You may know him as a superb consultant and thinker about education and technology. You may know him as part of the Brian Alexander Lookalike Contest, but overall, he is just a fantastic, fantastic person. And without any further ado, I would really like to bring him up on stage. And hello, Ruben. Hey, Brian, how are you doing? Very well. Where have we found you today? Uh, you found me in, well, in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And in what you're seeing here is part of my exploration into possible learning spaces for the future. Mm. So this here is an exploration of how you can take some modernist ideas and blend them into sort of solar punk exteriors. You can't see the solar punk exterior in this particular rendering. But uh, part of the idea is to say, well, how, how do you get from here to there where climate change is concerned? How do you take buildings that were designed with a modernist idea for education yeah. and mm -hmm. get them there? But, you know, that's a topic for another day. So uh, well, I, can, but, I can see the green behind you. And I can also yeah. see a kind of brown or tan colored um, stylized musical note. So we've got the modernist aspect there. Yep. Well, Ruben, we're going to have to bring you back just to talk about this um, in, all, in all seriousness. Um, but, you, you know, we ask people to introduce themselves in all kinds of ways. Um, and one of the traditional ways is to praise someone's beard. And your beard is, of course, terrific. But I'd also, I'd also like to ask, what are you working on for the next year? Are you mostly focusing on open source AI and uh, solar punk educational design? Yeah, that's a great question. So a large portion of what I'm doing is indeed AI, not just open source, but a very large chunk of it is indeed going to be open source. And I'm looking at the whole range of uses for AI, but in particular, my main focus right now is on generative AI, both image and text, as well as some of the deep learning applications. And, uh, you know, some of that is going to be commercial. So, I, you know, I do use MidJourney. I do use uh, ChatGPT4. I do use Wolfram Alpha, and they're great tools, make no mistake. But I also find that the open source, the Libre AI tools are just as essential to what I do, and in some ways, perhaps more so than the commercial ones, because they give me mm -hmm. both a tool set for carrying out ideas, for exploring ideas, but they also give me a tool set for digging deeper into understanding what's going on, into understanding what the tools mm. can, cannot do, why, how they do that, et cetera, in ways that, frankly, they commercial tools, because they are closed boxes for the most part, I cannot uh, use for that purpose. So, so yeah, that's going to be a large chunk of my work for the coming year. Oh, excellent, excellent. Um... Well, then, the, I just want to start off, friends, if you're new to the forum, I usually start off by interrogating our poor guests with a few uh, questions to get the ball rolling. But then I want to get out of the way and uh, open the floor to all of you for your questions. So as Ruben and I speak, please think about your questions. And remember, in the forum, all questions are good. We're excited about all of them. So if, if we're throwing around terminology, please don't be afraid to ask, what does Libre mean? How is that different from open? Um, and uh, please ask us questions at any point. Um, the, and again, if you have any technical questions, please ping Wesson, uh, who will be glad to help you. Um, I, I mean, my first question, I guess, is, Ruben, if, if you could just talk us through, first, what are some of the really important open AI tools in generative AI that we should be looking at as academics? 
Sure. So I would say that if I were looking at academics at AI, I would start right away with the uh, large language models that are available in the open source slash Libre world. So I would look at tools that are based on a, a model that is not completely open source or Libre, which is based on Llama, which was released by Meta uh, from its work, and now Llama 2, which is somewhat more open, but we still don't have full access to the mm. training set, as well as some other related tools, Red Pajamas, for instance, which is truly open since we do have access to the training set the weights, models built upon it, et cetera. And some other newcomers to the field, uh, Falcon, for instance, which is done by a consortium with some contributions from the Middle Eastern uh, countries, as well as some older tools like Bloom, which was developed by the EU. So there's a huge range of them, but really right now the hot uh, developments, if you will, are all happening in the environment of Llama, Red Pajamas and Falcon, in other words, that particular family or set of tools are very similar to ChatGPT as uh, how they're designed as large language models, what you can do with them, how you can use them. So, so I would definitely say that's one set of tools that's worthwhile looking at. And then a second tool is the generative image tools. Mm. And uh, stable diffusion is sort of the ruler, if you will, of the kingdom there in terms of the most advanced, the most developed tool. And once again, that is indeed open source. You have access uh, to the model. You have access to the training sets based on the Lion training sets. So you can see what images it was uh, trained on and exploring. Oh. And uh, so you, can, you actually have access to, again, all the necessary tools for digging in. So if you were to say, well, I've only got limited time, mm -hmm. those are the two I would focus on. If you have a bit more time, it's worthwhile digging into it. it this is a rich cornucopia of Python, what I call it Python Lego kit mm. for building other tools. And this gets a little bit deeper. You need a little bit of coding experience, but you don't need to be an experienced programmer. You can use tools like ChatGPT and now some other Libre tools to help you with constructing solutions. But these allow you to look at data, complex uh, sets of data, such as, again, if we're talking climate change, uh, and you want to make sense of what's going on with the uh, fires in Canada. You know, they can. I noticed you posted on your uh, Twitter stream. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to call it the next stream for now. Nobody is. Uh, nobody is. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, so you, I noticed you posted the map of the Canadian fires, and that tells you what's happening. But if you want to make sense of how these fires are progressing, how mm. they're connected to climate change and so on, you need a, a deep set of tools to do that. And uh, you can build those out. Now, that, that's a little bit further along. That's a bit deeper. I would recommend starting with the large language models and the generative image models as a good place to sink your teeth into the topic. And then as, you're more as you become more comfortable with those, build out from them. I see. I see. Um, well, that's a great list uh, right there. Uh, and but actually, let me interrupt myself. Uh, we have a good a good. Uh, clarifying question on this from our, our friend Tom Hames. Um, and uh, uh, Tom asks, <clears throat> if I can press the button right there. Whoop. What tool would you send normals to who are fascinated by ChatGP in order to demonstrate that open AI is not the only game in town? And I'm going to infer that by normals, you mean somebody who isn't used to coding, somebody who isn't used to the open source world, uh, someone who just wants to, uh, you know, a peek into okay. that world. Okay. So right now, the simplest tool to just get a taste of what's going on is there's a tool for uh, iPhones and Android phones that is based on the Red, the Red Pajama team has uh, put this tool out. And uh, we can afterwards, uh, Brian, I'm sure we can add the links so people can download it uh, from the archive uh, later on. I, I'd rather not get into 10,000 URLs in the chat. But uh, those tools are very simple. You just download them, you put them on your phone or your iPad or your Android tablet or your Android phone, whatever it may happen to be. And then they allow you to run small. These are the smallest models. Don't expect you know, great miracles uh, from them to mm. get a taste of what's possible with uh, open uh, source AI. And then if you go beyond that, uh, again, uh, Brian and I discussed this a little bit before this session, but we're going to have, or you already have, in fact, I think, available to you from the invite link, uh, yes. several of the sources, which are not quite as simple as just plug and play, 
but they are pretty simple. In other words, they'll run on a Mac, they'll run on a PC. You download them, you install them, you put the model you want inside, and you can run it. So it's a little bit like saying you buy your car, you put, hmm. you either plug it into the wall or you buy some gasoline according to whatever you're using these days, hopefully the former, uh, and then you're ready to roll. It, so those are not quite as simple as uh, the phone or uh, tablet-based tools, but they are pretty simple. And of course, again, if you really want to start digging deep, then all of these allow you to get under the hood, change the code, mm. see what the code is doing, etc. And the, the sky's the limit once you're doing that. And that's something I want to emphasize right now, Brian, because uh, one of the things you read in the press is a lot of, oh, nobody knows what it's doing. That's a flat out lie. I can look at mm. the code running on my little AI bot and I can tell you, oh, okay, so here it's uh, running into an issue here. Here's why it gave me this wrong result. You can actually do that. Does that require a little bit more digging than just running it? Yes. But is it as difficult or opaque mm -hmm. as some of the reports mm -hmm. have made out to be? No, that's not true at all. Are there mm. complexities where we're still trying to figure out, gee, this is working exactly how, what are the fine details? Sure. But the bigger picture? No, that, that's perfectly accessible. Uh, that's a great point. So starting with the red pajamas and, of course, starting with uh, Tom's question. Um, thank you, Tom. It's a very good one, as always. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a Q&A box question. So you can just type that in and I'll flash it on the screen. Uh, and speaking of flashing on the screen, um, I just shared uh, in the chat uh, a link to the login page for today's event. Um, not to be redundant, but that's where Ruben uh, listed a whole series of, of, of tools and platforms to explore. Uh, so you can just grab that at any point. Um, then, then let me ask a second question, and, 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 and I want to open it up. Uh, we've been talking so far in terms of, uh, I think, individual users. So what happens as Tom says, a normal person, um, you know, you've been talking about people who have some experience with code. But if we can just scale up our examination for a second and think about an academic sure. institution, say a college or a university, or even a division or a department, what are, what's some of the advice you have for, for these organizations as they look into the AI world and consider the open source work? That's a great a question, Brian. I think one of the first things I would suggest is that this is not a question that is a just wait and see type question, nor is it just a fad or a trend. I realize some people have been claiming that that simply isn't the case. This has been coming a long time. Yes, it's true that ChatGPT was wow a big surprise because people saw what it could do. But in fact, if you'd see, been following large language models for a while, you knew it was coming sometime in, if not this year, next. Or that one. And similarly with uh, image generation and similarly with other deep learning tools. So it's important to realize that this is not a just a flash in the pan, something that showed up one day and it's going to go away. It's something that really deeply transforms uh, how mm. we think about learning, how we think about academe, how, and how we think about the world of jobs in general, the, the world that we inhabit. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is you need to engage in serious conversations around this. Because one of the things that concerns me is a lot of people are being told, well, you're on your own, folks. Uh, have fun. And that's really not a great way to do things. Because in particular, one of the things I would argue about AI and where we're at right now and where these tools are right now and where Libre open source AI is, is that it allows us the space for taking a step back and saying, hey, how do we really achieve what we wanted to achieve in academe? I see a lot of people, for instance, worrying and saying, oh, we've already seen decline of enrollments in the humanities, that's it. This is the death knell. That's exactly wrong. If anything, hmm. Brian, I would argue that this could be the rebirth of the humanities. Hmm. The place, if we think about it with the appropriate context, the appropriate tools at the appropriate support, it can be the place where we get back at the heart of why the humanities, what it is that we want out of this. Why? Because one of the things that we need to make the best use of AI, the most equitable use of AI as well, hmm. fairest, the one that gives people individual agency over what they do in their learning, in their work, what they do, requires critical thinking at the very deep level. And we need to get back then to the thinking about the humanities, what we do in the humanities, writing, reading, the processes associated with that, with sharing, discussing, and so on. 
as a way of getting at that critical thinking approach, at those tool sets for understanding. And similarly, and you and I have spoken about this before, and I'm sure some people in the audience have heard me talk about this before, other aspects also come to the foreground, for instance, of reading. For instance, the uses of metaphor as a tool for thinking. If you're thinking about complex phenomena that are likely to lead to black swan type phenomena, if you're trying to think about how you develop resilience and anti-fragility in the face of complex phenomena, such as climate change, such as pandemics, such as huge global migrations of people for multiple reasons, you need to be able to think in terms of futures. You need to think, be able to think in terms of possibilities. You need to be able to think in ways that don't just reflect the same way you've been thinking all along. And the uses of metaphor, which is something that you mm. learn from reading, from not just reading, watching film, from theater, from performing, again, from the rich scope of what you get from the arts and the humanities is also a key component of that. So this is the other aspect that I would give as advice. Think how you bring those conversations to the, few, to the foreground and think about how you support them and how you support your faculty in terms of opportunity, support in every way that you need it, whether it's release, the time, etc. And yes, finances were appropriate, resources were appropriate, etc. to engage in that conversation. Excellent. What a great answer. Um, and as a humanist who plays with technology, I, I, I share this on a great deal. But th let me let me stop asking questions, uh, friends, because you all have questions that have been piling up. But I want to make sure that uh, you get a crack at Ruben, each of you. Uh, and this is one um, that uh, looks ahead a couple of weeks. And this is a very practical one. And I'm going to put a little spin on it. Just just you see what I mean. Uh, this is from Carly Brady at Medicine, who says, planning for our fall in service. What would you prepare for an agenda for a presentation to faculty on AI? And it's a great question, Carly. And the spin I was going to put on it is, what part about open source AI? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. So it, basically, for a presentation on AI, I would look towards thinking, what will the faculty be doing with AI, right? So I would put in a few what I would call, it's not exactly low hanging fruit, rather it's a question of an understanding of AI in terms of the type of things that faculty do. And this is of course where I'd need to you know, sit down and think, okay, so what are your faculty's primary activities? What have you seen them do? What have you seen them be curious about, et cetera? So that, that meets their interests. So I would look to saying, okay, this is what AI does in terms of what you would do. So start them off with an actual, get their hands dirty, okay? Just play with the toy a little bit. And then in terms of introducing Libre AI, just look to some type of activity that helps scaffold understanding of yeah. what's going on. And for instance, one of the things I find is a very rewarding activity is to take a very small model, one of the, well, small, seven billion parameters. I know that doesn't sound very small, but it is compared to some of the larger ones that you might use and then take a 65 billion parameter and show the type of patterns that the model detects. Because one of the things is people keep thinking about, well, does chat GPT or do the large language models, uh, large language models think? And the answer is no, they, they are pattern detectors, pattern constructors. Right. They are tools that can both uh, elicit inferential patterns, instantiate inferential patterns, create something according to a set of patterns, but there's no thinking behind it. And that's important to realize. The, the AI doesn't want to do anything. It doesn't think about it. And for faculty to be able to try out, to get their hands dirty with that, and to see how it can become less or more effective in different ways. And that the Libre AI tool allows you to see that because ChatGPT4 is always operating at maximum efficiency, right? But if you can say, well, this okay. is what happens if you have fewer parameters. This is what happens if you have more parameters. Oh, it starts nice. to give people a little bit of a taste of what's going on. And with the image AIs, you can do the same thing. What happens if you tell it, well, deviate a, a lot from the original idea. They do an interplay between shape. You tell it, you know, match the shape very closely. Now, don't match it as closely. And again, uh, Midjourney has some amazing tools, but there are oh. some things you can do with stability, uh, stable day, a diffusion, diffusion that allow people to see, oh, so that's what's going on under the hood. So that's the type of thing I would look at, a mixture of the pragmatic, 
what are you going to do with this? What does this enable that you couldn't do before? Mm. And this, and finally, answer, because let's be realistic, there are there, the fears. In other words, the fear mm-hmm. that I mm-hmm. do this and now it's going to become useless. Or I do this and now it's, uh, go, you know, all the students are just going to use chat GPT or whatever, and it's not going to be useful anymore. And gently guide them through, well, how do you rethink this? And, you know, when people ask me, so what would you recommend as references? Uh, I would recommend looking, for instance, at, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, John Bean and Dan Meltzer's uh, book, Engaging Ideas. It's now in its third edition. Dan Meltzer came in into the third edition. And one of the things you can do in preparation for something like this type of session is say, okay, so take ideas from engaging ideas, for instance, where writing is concerned, and say, how do you take one of these projects and rethink it, remix it, transmogrify it in light of something like uh, a large language model tool so that the heart of the project, the heart of the tool, the heart of the assessment, whatever it may happen to be, the writing project, etc., reflects what you want it to do, always say with critical thinking, except only better if you bring in chat GPT into the mixture. And again, what nice. you're trying to what I'm trying to say is here, don't try to do everything for faculty because you can't. Okay. Right. But right. you can at least show them a path. You can show them how you take apart, how you take how you take the old engine, if you will. Okay, so let's go back to sure. that metaphor about the car. So this is the place at which you take your old car and you replace its uh, internal combustion engine with a modern electric engine. Yeah, I know it's not easy to do that. Okay, <laughs> let, let's take the metaphor a little bit further. Perfect. And instead of, instead of giving everybody their own car, you show them, well, this is how you do this and this is how you would apply the process mm. to get to where mm. you want to go. I like this. I like this. Oh, that's that's a okay. First of all, Carly, that's a great, great question, okay. and I think Ruben is just giving you a, a, a an agenda to to work through. So I want to thank you for that question, and, and Ruben, thank you for that uh, for that fantastic answer. Um, and uh, and I just want to make sure the uh, uh, engaging ideas. That's John Bean and Dan Meltzer. Yeah, John Bean and and Dan Meltzer. It's the third edition. It is worthwhile getting okay. the third edition. Uh, because there's a couple of new things that have come in that are actually ideally suited. Uh, The old editions are still great, don't get me wrong. Uh, But uh, the new edition in particular has some of the latest research, some thinking about tool sets, et cetera, that is particularly well suited to being transmogrified in light of large uh, language models, for instance. So. Very good. I just put a link to uh, uh, to the book there in the chat if, if, if Thank you folks want to pursue that. Uh, we have a quick video question from uh, Guy Wilson uh, coming to us from Missouri. And hello, Guy. Hi. Um, so basically, I'm on the side where I support the um, instructional technologies. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously, I think if people saw the, the Blackboard announcements last week. Canvas was making announcements this morning. Um, they're adding a, um, AI powered layout tool. Um, they're going to have an AI lo- based marketplace for their partners, uh, I guess for AI, AI stuff. They're bringing Khan Academy's Conmigo writing coach to canvas. Um, mm-hmm. so we're seeing all of those kinds of things that are going to be pulled in and we're already starting to integrate a couple of tools that involve AI, but are there, are you aware of any AI uh, open source, open AI based, open based AI tools that will are being are projects that are being developed for LMSs. Mm. So the mm. so uh, that's a great question. The answer is yes. I know that there are people working on this. I don't know anybody that has one ready to roll out. Now, mm. I would obviously look at the Moodle crowd to see mm-hmm. who's l- most likely to be the first out the gate. If I had to make a guess, I'd say Moodle and Canvas would be my two first guesses. Moodle on the uh, Libre open source, Canvas on the commercial, just because of um, the ease of integration of some bits and pieces. So. Uh, so I am aware that there are projects working on this, but I could not give you a timeline on when the tools be, will be ready for a rollout. I will say that I suspect it's going to be sooner rather than later. There's been a lot of effort in the Libre community to say, hey, how do we make sure we have hooks to everything? So a simple example, uh, we've, we're seeing right now a whole series of tools that use small models 
do, you can run them on pretty much any machine. But they use small models to get at specialized fields of inquiry. So we have, for instance, small tools to do things like design experiments for biochemistry. You're a biochemist, you're a research uh, designer, right? You're designing, this is not for a toy, this is actually for designing uh, true research projects. But there's a whole series of things you want to keep in mind, etc. Uh, there are now some tools that work in specialized domains. And the reason these tools are coming out as quickly as they are is there's been an effort by the community to make sure that all the pieces talk to each other. So I'd expect to see it sooner rather than later. But as I say, I honestly couldn't give you an exact timeline on that. Thank you. Oh, great question. Thank you, Guy. Yeah, very um, good question. If, and if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. So if you'd like to join us, you don't have to have a beard. Um, just press the raised hand button down the bottom of the screen. And by the way, a shout out to Vic uh, on Mastodon, who has been live tuning uh, our session so far. Bravo for doing that. I think that may be the first time uh, that we've had a, a live discussion on Mastodon there. So I'm really glad to see it. Uh, and, and speaking of uh, video questions, we have one from our great friend and uh, AI stalwart, Brent Anders, coming to us from what is probably close on midnight out in Armenia right now. Hello, Brent. Hello, hello. So yeah, this is a great discussion. Uh, I love the idea of the rebirth of the humanities through AI. That's, that's, mm. that, that's uh, definitely a, an awesome uh, way to look at it. Okay, so here's my question. Um, and this kind of ties a little bit with the previous question. With Moodle, this is the only learning management system that I've found that has a plugin that uh, recently they've recently released this that you can embed chat GPT within your Moodle. But the, the, the coolest part of that isn't that the coolest part is this holy grail aspect that I'm looking for. And hopefully you can give some illumination on this yeah. is the power and ability to have another layer within that process. And this other layer cool. is that the plugin allows you to put in a file with content. So this would be, I'm teaching a class in professional communication. So yeah. I put specific information about what do I mean when I say verbal communication? What do I, what do I mean when I say nonverbal communication? All these specifics to the topic that I'm teaching. So that's a layer that ChatGPT will look at before it answers. So it's not just sort of going into a database of information and then giving an answer. No, it's first looking at what I as the teacher say, this is the correct stuff. So now it's gonna use that to give information to the student. I see that as the holy grail of, of AI because so many instructors, they want to unleash AI with their students. They want their students to use AI on their own even to help with learning the content, but they want it to be more specific to exactly what they're teaching. So they want to avoid the confusion of an AI giving a different response than what they're pushing. Have you heard of anything like that as far as maybe using a hybrid of something like ChatGPT and an open source and then putting it together? Now, I realize that in this plugin implementation, it is using an API because it, you're having to call it and it's, you know, it's costing some money. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with you that that's a hugely powerful use of the tool set. And to answer your question, yes, there's already work on that. Uh, so the easiest way to get into that is, again, if you look at the links that uh, Brian posted with uh, the tools, the tool for text, uh, a, an interface for a web interface for the large open source Libre large language models has that as a feature. You can feed it in a proper format, exactly what you're describing, a list of texts. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, well, use this in this way. There are many ways of getting at it. They can go from feeding it in a very fire hose way, for lack of a better word, where you just take all the text and you say, vroom, you know, here's a huge set of text. OK, go to it using these test texts as the parameter for your reply to a much more nuanced way in which you're saying, well, use this in this way to reply to this. So you can construct it as fine-grained or as, as I say, fire hose as you like. If you need something more sophisticated than what's in there, there's a whole series of Libre tools. Again, uh, Brian, I'll be happy to send you some links Please. for those. They require a little bit more effort, but not that much more. And again, I'm not aware of any full interfaces yet mm -hmm. into Moodle and so on, but we're not far from that. It's it, There's no reason it can't be done. It's just a matter of all the bits and pieces 
uh, hooking together. So you could do this, for instance, saying you're teaching a course in you know, management and you want to have the course informed by X team cases that you have already in text files or PDF files or whatever format it is. So that that's the what the wellspring your students are drawing from. And then you might ask students say to bring in their own suggestions and add them to the mix and see what happens with it. That's already doable. It's just not fully integrated yet with things like Moodle and so on. And again, this is also one place where uh, the experimentation is important because you'll find that if you use very small amounts of text, you don't get enough richness to make this possible. You need yeah. to give it more than a certain amount. Now, what that critical amount is, we're still figuring out. It turns out to be less than people feared. At the beginning, people were thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna need thousands upon thousands of text for everything. So say you can do quite well with you know a few dozen to, it depends on the field, it depends on what you're trying to do and so mm -hmm. on. But that is one caveat, that what you want to do may require more or fewer text than what somebody else wants to do. Again, early days, I think this is all going to become fairly systematized within the next year or so. Well, that sounds like yeah, a terrific. Uh, Brent, thank you for uh, sharing the Holy Grail idea with us. That, that's a that's a terrific one. And uh, also, just another shout out, reminder, uh, Brent uh, published a book on AI literacy that I strongly recommend uh, that everyone grab a copy of. And please, Brent, throw a link in the chat so uh, people can grab it. Uh, and again, Ruben, thank you for the for the excellent, excellent uh, answer uh, in great detail. Uh, this is why I wanted to have you here. Um, one reason. Uh, we have a bunch of other questions coming in, um, and I want to make sure that uh, everyone gets a chance to raise these. And this is one from a really, really good practical question from Elizabeth. Uh, it's, I believe it's Pachella. If it's Pachella, I, I apologize. Uh, and she asks, many college networks have security features that restrict access to AI tools, e.g. I can't access Bing chat on campus. What are the risks to the operating system or network when using AI tools and how to mitigate this? That's, again, that's a great question. Obviously, uh, there's a question of how your campus policies are set up, right? And there's questions, of course, one of the things about Libre AI that I point out is if you're worried about privacy, nothing better for privacy than to have it on your and a machine that sits on your desk mm -hmm. and is only accessible mm -hmm. from your desk. So uh, the, if you absolutely have to, you know, limit the network access and so on, you can have this on the machine on your desk. You only need to connect it to the network when you download the models and you download the software and or you update it, but it can be offline and you can unplug physically any drives that say might have information. If you were doing this, for instance, on, uh, I do some research on qualitative analysis of interviews and you want to keep those interviews private and you want to make sure they cannot be accessed. But put them on a hard drive, unplug it. If a hard drive isn't plugged in, I don't quite know yeah. short of, magical fairies, how it's going to get anywhere. So that's the most secure. But uh, as with all of these, I recommend that people consider either running locally, the cost of the machines has come down dramatically. It's not significantly different from a machine you might be using yourself. Obviously, different resources at different locations. But to give you an idea, a machine that would have been considered a mid-range machine for gaming a couple of years prior to the pandemic, mm. that will get you just fine with all of the current Libre tools to a useful level. That's what I use myself, actually. It's not a particularly fancy or powerful machine, it, but it was inexpensive, relatively speaking, to build. Uh, nice. Obviously, if you want to get fancier, you can do that. And then you can go out. So again, if you have a machine, then it's controlled by your local policies and it's as good, the security is as good as the security of your network. If you go out to the cloud, you can rent machines online. And there, I have to say, you have to go on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, sure. Some companies sure. have very strict policies for security. So they, for instance, if they work with medical records, they're going to have, yeah. assuming it's a responsible company, and you know, you, this is where I would go to medical schools that, or hospitals that use their services and check with them to see what their reports are. They're going to have stringent security protocols in place. I've worked with some of these in the past on different projects and... Uh, Hypothetically, you could always break in, but they would have taken a major effort, frankly, uh, to do so. Others are more open and you have to decide. So for instance, if you use Google Collab, Google Collab has both a free tier and a uh, paid tier. And you can right. use that to run some small uh, LLM 
uh, models. But I'll be honest with you, the security ain't great and the privacy ain't great. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. use it for anything mm -hmm. where security or privacy is a concern. But that's uh, the short and long of it is you can make it as local as you want at not too high a cost per person to cloud secured instances to if you want out there. But then, of course, you are in a less secure environment. Well, thank you for that uh, quick and very, very detailed breakdown, um, Ruben. And uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for the really, really good question. Uh, it's a very, very important aspect um, of, of the topic to, to think through. Uh, we have another question from uh, Brent, another Brent, uh, Presley, um, and who asks uh, a very technical question, which you may already have pointed us to. Uh, are there any resources for helping someone to fine tune one of the open source models? Yes. In fact, again, this is a, one of the sets in the, uh, one of the resources that uh, Brian shared, the last one, in fact, allows you to go far beyond fine tuning. It allows you to build one from scratch. So if you want to go all the way out, uh, you can do so. And if you look at the resources available link from that, you have for less ambitious people, how you might fine tune and so on. But here's also where I'm going to recommend using the wisdom of crowd, so to speak. I spend a lot of time on Reddit, uh, Discord, and if, there are a few others, but those are the two major sites as well as the discussions uh, on GitHub for the repositories for the source themselves. And the community is overall what I would call a welcoming one. As with all of these communities, there may be the person that loses their temper every now and then, or it's not very nice. But by and large, every, you know, a, the community will support questions. And uh, just to give you an example, right now, as I said earlier, um, Meta released Llama 2 as its second set of quasis or somewhat open source uh, model sets. And there's some questions as to some strange things that are happening with Llama 2. And hmm. I'm finding that, uh, frankly, I'm getting faster answers from other people experimenting with this than from Meta. It's not that Meta is trying to be you know, bad or obstructionist. They're just getting bombarded with questions. And in the meantime, uh, the people on GitHub are saying, hey, I tried this experiment and this worked or this didn't work, or I know it's this bit of code that seems to be causing a problem here. And uh, the bottom line is uh, I'm seeing a very rapid evolution towards this particular problem that I'm seeing with uh, things not having a long enough scope to answer a question at times uh, getting solved in the next day or so. so. So that's the other recommendation I would make. So you have this site and you have resources attached to it. But also, I strongly recommend, as I say, Reddit, uh, Discord, and uh, GitHub are your go-tos. Uh, other communities, of course, can be as well, but those are the three I found best. And last but far from least, uh, take a look at some of the courses that are out there, Coursera for free, and some others uh, on YouTube, et cetera, or some others that are not quite free, but... Uh, relatively inexpensive that can also provide some support in this regard. Well, thank you for the great answer. And Brent, uh, what a really good question. Uh, we're slicing this problem uh, from multiple directions, coming up with a, a, a bunch of different aspects, which is really, really good. Uh, and then uh, I'm delighted to uh, raise a question from uh, my colleague at Georgetown, William Choi. Um, who is also uh, just a brilliant, brilliant person. Uh, and William asks, when OpenAI switched from open to closed source releases, they claimed they were trying to prevent widespread malicious use. Do you think that open releases can be balanced with public safety? Uh, the short answer is yes. I think, I think in fact, uh, this is a question that has come up many, many times before in the context of operating systems. So when people said, well, when you go to an, a system like Linux, uh, for instance, for which has become, frankly, the main underpinning of many of the systems that run the web today, uh, uh, the fact that it's open source, couldn't somebody inject malicious code and so on? And the answer is always no. the same. It's actually yes, but many, many eyes help keep that from happening. And so there have been attempts, no, make no mistake about injecting malicious code, mm. but many perspectives help. And something similar happens here because the other thing is OpenAI, again, I have the, a huge amount of respect for their research team. Make no mistake. Eh? I'm very impressed with what they've achieved, but it still is a relatively small company. And there's a difference between 
you know, even a dozen or a couple of dozen people looking at something to say, how can this be made? You know, how can we make sure this doesn't get into trouble versus having thousands upon thousands? And that's what you're seeing right now with the open source, the Libre models. When I'm asking a question or I'm posing, hey, I'm seeing this problem with Llama 2, I'm not seeing something that's the size of the team at OpenAI. I'm seeing something that's larger as a community than all of the a, AI software companies taken together, including some people from those software companies who spend time on these community sites to help mm. with them. So we all want this to be usable. We want it to be safe. We want it to be you know, a, very much accessible to people. But I don't think that that's in any way incompatible provided that we have this community dynamic moving forward. In other words, one of the things that doesn't work, and we've seen this happen, sometimes is where you take an open source uh, project and you say, well, now it's only going to be these five privileged people from mm -hmm. here on out mm -hmm. that get to look at it. And so that's not good. That That's where suddenly things start going the wrong way. So, so uh, yes, I, I think so. And I think, again, the open, the libre aspect is essential to this. I think it's also essential, by the way, to understanding where issues can arise. So let, let me give you an example of this because this is an important question. One of the questions is, uh, how do you use AI and deal with things such as built-in prejudice or biases, etc.? And the trouble is if it's closed, I have no way of knowing right. what went in right. there. But if it's open and libre, I can actually today take any one of my models and deliberately set up a scenario which gets at the toughest types of bias to eradicate. So the type of thing that is so buried historically that people don't even realize there's a historical bias, okay? The type of thing that has to do, for instance, sadly in the US, with things like the policies of the Woodrow Wilson administration that suddenly stripped black uh, workers of protections, right. of jobs, et cetera, right? That had a huge impact going forward but it's not the same as the type of thing that people think about as somebody, well, somebody overtly, you know, a, calling somebody names or overtly. It's, it's something that has an impact moving forward. And it can have a pernicious effect in the sense of saying, well, this then biased how businesses, for instance, gained access to money. This biased how banks, for instance, made loans and made money. So if an AI just looks at this from a naive perspective, it right. says, oh, well, yeah. doing this gives you the best yield. Look at the historical records. Yeah, but the historical record was driven by the fact that these events took place during the Woodrow Wilson administration that thereafter cut these people off so that they didn't have access to this. So within what the AI may recommend, there's going to be a bias that's going to be harder to get. At. Now, if I know what's went into the Libre AI, I can say, aha, I will now construct deliberately explorations that will allow me in turn to say, this is how I construct explorations. This is how I construct queries of the AI that get the AI to say, by the way, this was caused by X, Y, and Z. Therefore, you should look at alpha, beta, gamma, whatever, to change this. And again, this is not a trivial question. This is something that's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of work by people working with AIs to decide how you triage this, how you decide what you're looking at. But I keep coming back to this is what Libre AI, this is what Open AI makes possible. Because if I can't see what's going in there, if I have no way of getting at what's going on, it's much more difficult to get at this type of question. Transparency is one of the great benefits of, of open source. Indeed. Well, thank you for that excellent answer, Ruben. Um, that's that's a terrific question. Or and, and I do want to make sure that um, uh, we get some uh, some other questions in here. By the way, some of you have asked questions about AI in general, and I'm, I'm saving those for the end because uh, focus right now is an open source. Um, so uh, we uh, for everyone else who wants to ask a specifically open source question, um, we're going to get you guys first. And here's one right now. Uh, this is um, uh, oops. Yeah, it's coming in from Daniel Schoen. The open source initiative is driving a conversation to define what open source AI even is with the aim of providing guidance to key stakeholders. Any thoughts on that effort? 
I think it, I think it's an important conversation to be having. I, I one of the things I do want to see it though is I will see it in multiple places, and this is something that goes to one of the aspects I think is going to be important because I think uh, sometimes when people say, well, let's look at AI and sort of take this monolithic approach, you really need to be having the conversation about what open source AI and how it's going to be used in different settings in different contexts. You know. I'll be honest with you, I appreciate what the EU has done in terms of trying to create a grand framework for AI, AI safety, responsibility, etc. I'll also be honest with you, I'm not convinced it's the best approach. I think you're going to need a, pl a conversation that takes place in multiple places. It's a lot messier, okay? I'm not going to deny that. But I don't think we're going to come down to just one overarching set of principles. Rather, I think we're going to come up with different principles that get different instantiations in different contexts and different conversations that will be necessary to see how to best apply those principles, develop those principles, and so on. So again, I don't think it's a question you know, of saying, well, we need this regulatory frame. We do need regulatory frameworks, plural. But I don't think they're going to be just you know, the grand regulatory framework for AI, rather I think we're going to see ideas about how to regulate instances, uses, contexts for AI in different scenarios, in different contexts, and that in turn is going to help define the conversation about what open source AI was, what Libre AI is in the first place. Oh, that's great. Um, we're a really good question, and, and thank you again, uh, Pribut, for this. Um, we have, um, I think we have questions that kind of straddle the uh, divide between open and, uh, and proprietary uh, AI. So uh, let me just ask one from uh, Chandrika. Uh, and this is, let's see, make sure I get this one up here. What are your opinions about AI tools related to instructional design, such as IDAssist.co? Are such tools safe to use? For example, IDAssist is a Chrome extension and open data risk. And that's a new one for me, actually. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, uh, you you've said it yourself. In other words, you have to go on a case by case basis. What are the what are the safeguards built into the tool and into the framework that's embedded in the tool? I mean, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, there are contexts in the EU, for instance, where uh, you cannot use uh, the type of approach that's used by many Google plugins, etc., because they do not satisfy. Uh, EU regulations, right. there can be issues as to, so where's the data from the plugin store relative to this, et cetera. So you, you, it really is a case by case basis. And I would recommend looking at it as such. Again, I do keep coming back to the idea that with open source or Libre, it's make no mistake. It's not that I can say, oh, every tool is uh, much more secure, but I, it's easier for me to at least say, well, I've created an environment within which that tool in particular is secure. And let me give you an example by way of a practice in some of the Libre AI that is not secure. Uh, some of the Libre AI tools say, oh, run this code remotely on a remote server. There, I would say, look at the remote server, look at what it's doing, look at how it's interacting. In some cases that allows you, yes, to run tools that you could not run locally because it exceeds the computational capacity of your system. But the minute you do that, then you have to look at that carefully and decide, are the trade-offs worth it to you or not? As I said before, I do work with interviews, but if it's an interview that I've conducted and I have privacy guarantees for the interviewee and so on, etc., that is not going on any public site where I have any doubts whatsoever. If that's staying on my system, and as I said before, if it's not being used, it's unplugged. Very good. The great air gap. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Chen, uh, Chandrika, for the question. And I, I forwarded uh, from them a, uh, a link to um, uh, that one uh, plugin. Uh, we have a couple of uh, more general questions now, which um, I know, Ruben, you are you are more than happy to, to address. And this is one for our good friend, Mark Corbett Wilson. And this is a more strategic question. Can Ruben give us his thoughts on the weaponization of AI? The MIC, I think that means military industrial complex, is integrated with both corporations and educational institutions. Lethal autonomous weapons are already in the market. So I think he's referring to literal weaponization. Yeah, no, 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 no. I understand. And the answer to that is uh, this is one where it is crucial that all sectors of society, but 
most definitely academe get involved in the conversation. This is not something that you should say, oh, well, let's leave it uh, to the military or to the arms vendors. No, everybody needs to be involved because this is not, a, let, let's be clear about this. A, some of the uses of these autonomous weapons are very, very scary indeed. I'm not, the, I'm not worried about, you know, a Skynet scenario. That, that's, that's not the type of scenario. But the type of scenario where suddenly it becomes easy to say, well, you know, you're just sending in a drone and, well, if you're, you don't long, no longer have a stake with soldiers on the ground, you know, and if there are a few collateral casualties, oh, well, so that worries me. That's Now, to, the good news is there are people in the military and there are people indeed in some of the people that supply weapons to the military that are indeed very much engaged with the idea of no, we there, there has to be a code of ethics, there have to be codes of ethics around this and so on. But I do want to emphasize this cannot be left just to the military or just to the arms vendors. Once again, this has to involve everybody. So every time I hear they, well, this is too complicated for itself, sorry, no, that that's not a legitimate answer. Those of us in academe, we are teachers, we are learners. We have a duty to become better teachers and learners mm -hmm. so that we mm -hmm. can explain this and involve people in real conversations. And, you know, this it, this would be a wonderful conversation for another day. What type of conversations? How do you scaffold this type of project? You know, a, there are several deliberative democracy uh, projects that have very much the right type of tool set that if augmented with understanding access to the tools and technology can help inform conversations about this that would be a very long conversation, as I say, very worthwhile one for another day. But the important thing is it has to happen. It cannot be something that we in academe step back from or that society steps back from and just says, hey, just leave it to the professionals. It really has to be a conversation about ethical decisions, ethical mm -hmm. uses mm -hmm. that has to involve all of the society. And thank you, well, because that's a crucial question to be asked. Uh, what a great exchange from, from both of you. Uh, um, I'm a big fan of Mark and his thinking, and uh, he uh, he also notes in chat that uh, this applies to creating propaganda, uh, and that's something I've been experimenting with with ChatGPT. Um, thank you for that for that answer, Ruben. We're we're almost completely out of time, uh, so I wanted to ask one question, looking ahead a bit. Um, what might a college or university look like in just say three or four years? If they really embrace uh, open source AI, what are some of the ways that that might change their operations, their their research, their day to day life, the classroom? That's a great question. Uh, I think, you know, we, I already mentioned one, of course, which is the re engagement with the task of critical thinking, with the humanities, with reading in a deep sense and reading in across multiple dimensions. Of course, books, but also other. Uh, you know, things, movies, uh, performances, etc. But I think there's other aspects that also come into the picture. So one of the things is, uh, Brian, and here I have to thank you for the in yeoman duty you've been doing in terms of keeping the issue of climate change and academia front and center. Thank you. We have hugely challenging questions. So I would like to see those questions become a key component of all conversations. That doesn't mean you abandon yeah. everything else. But I don't think we can go any further and say, oh, well, you know, somebody else will figure out climate change. Or I teach an X department and I don't see, no, sorry, we need to be having these again as conversations. And I think that the tools can help us do it. The tools won't do it for by yourself. Okay. It's like any, it's, it's like anything on SAMR. It's just straight substitution doesn't do anything. We're going to need to construct approaches to learning, approaches to thinking. But to your question, I would hope that a college or university that truly leverages the opportunities for AI is one that becomes, if anything, more deeply engaged with the questions of learning, mm. that engages mm. all of its communities, that engages the surrounding community, because that's another aspect. We have huge resources, but so frequently, you know, we always speak of the town-gown divide, and it's not always mm -hmm. a fair statement, etc. But nonetheless, we need to be talking about 
how these colleges, how these universities interact with the communities around them, how they interact with the politics of the world they inhabit. And again, will these tools do it for you? Not in the least. Could, if misused, could these tools make worse, things worse? Yes, of course. But the key thing is, if used correctly, if engaged with in these types of aspects that I'm talking about, I think it could give a new relevance. You know, when people speak about declining enrollment in academia, et cetera, well, I think the best way to address that, frankly, is by saying, how do you make academia more relevant, more engaged? more something that somebody says, yes, I want to be there. I want to engage with it. Or even if I'm not a part of that community, I want to be talking with that community because they are using these tools to make things happen, to take care of issues of scaling, for instance, scalability. There were issues uh, in the past. There uh, are many that you can start to address, as I say, to get into some of these deep aspects to help communities that did not have access to some understanding scaffold that understanding using some of these tools. So well, that's a fin- short version. Uh, that's a great version. And and I'm afraid that it is the last version we can offer this hour because we have run out of time. Um, Ruben, thank you for being just a fantastic, fantastic guest. You have given us so much to think about, so much to work on, um, both very practical hands-on tips as well as uh, guidance to how to think about all of this. Um, What's what's the best way to keep up with you these days? Are are you uh, are you putting your online efforts to Twitter or to Facebook or LinkedIn? Uh, right now, I'm switching more to, more and more to LinkedIn. You know, I don't know. I, I really don't like the idea of Xing. It, it sounds like I'm doing something terrible to the people I'm talking with. <laughs> uh, but but there's also a question of whether Twitter will continue to retain some of the aspects that made it so appealing at one point in time mm-hmm. as you know a, a public space and agora where people could talk with each other in interesting ways and so on and at this point i found linkedin is a good space i'm also experimenting with some of the other social platforms but for now let's say it's linkedin and i'm still keeping a toe in the water in twitter in the hope that it might still pull back from the brink of uh, complete dissolution before but it exits that, out. That's the best way. Yeah. Well, before thank it you. Out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, all kinds of questions people will have for you. We're going to bring you back, of course. Um, but in, in the meantime, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Brian. It's been a pleasure. Now, uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues, uh, we can please do this on, a, on as, as said, on a few different forums. Uh, Twitter, or the for- platform formerly known as Twitter, or Mastodon, just please use the hashtag FTTE, and here you can see uh, my logins uh, and my handles there, as well as on um, my blog, brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to look back into our previous sessions, in fact, here, let me just jump ahead a little bit. If you'd like, um, you can uh, take a look at uh, tinyurl.com slash uh, uh, FTF archive. You can look back at our previous sessions. Now we've got a dozen on AI. Um, if you want to look ahead, we have more sessions on AI coming as well as other topics. Just go to fork, forum, the future of education.us. Uh, if you'd like to uh, explore this further on my Substack, just get to uh, AI and academia.substack.com and uh, love to see what you think. And um, as we do all of this, uh, as we end every session, let me wish everybody well. I hope those of you in the Northern Hemisphere are not too cooked with uh, the heat dome that seems to be settling in different parts of our planet. I hope those of you in the Southern Hemisphere are uh, enjoying yourselves in, in your cooler seasons. Above all, I hope everybody is safe and sound as you prepare for the fall classes uh, and everything that we should anticipate from there. Thank you all so much for participating in a great session. We'll talk to you soon next time. See you online. Bye-bye.